Welcome to all of you to part two of our online teacher PD series. I'm Diane Conrad, principal of LEARN's virtual campus, and today I'm here with some of LEARN's online teaching team. Our team is spread out across the province in the Udaway region, West Island, Eastern Townships, and Quebec City, and our students come from all over Quebec too. We're a very connected team, and we've learned ways to communicate effectively despite our geographical distance. So in today's session, we want to share a few things that we've learned over 20 some years of teaching online in our organization. Most of you are new to online learning now, but you have been learning a lot very quickly. So we hope that we will learn from each other today so that we can all move forward together. So with me from right to left, Peggy Drolet, math teacher, Audrey McLaren, another online math teacher, Carrie Kuehl, who's a science teacher, Christine Thibault, who introduced herself, and Stephanie Myers, who's a psychology teacher. In pink in the picture is Natalie Dahlstedt, who is not joining us today, but is an important member of our team as well. For the purposes of this presentation, we've broken down the topic of communications and connections into these three subtopics. And I will pass things over to Audrey to get us started. Thanks, Diane. Hi, everybody. So first of all, uh, who's on the team? Pretty much the same as face-to-face. -face. Um, these three components we're going to talk about, starting with immediate staff. And uh, think of that as the people who you maybe teach the, who are in the same building as you or who used to be in the same building as you, taught the same course. Uh, I'm going to be talking to that from a teacher point of view. And of course, there's the admin. And Diane will be talking about team building from the admin point of view, as well as, of course, our parents, a, a crucial part of the team. And uh, Carrie and Peggy will be addressing uh, team building uh, with parents a little bit later in this webinar. Uh, I also want to mention on the team, uh, part of the immediate staff, I would say, is uh, the, the uh, people out there, maybe not in your building, maybe not in your school, maybe not even in your province, um, that are you can think of as part of your immediate staff room as well. It can include people that you've never met. Uh, we've all found a great many colleagues and networks of teachers through things like uh, Twitter hashtags groups and Facebook groups. Uh, there are many communities out there that can support you. Um, there are, uh, like I said, there are hashtags that you can follow on Twitter and there are educator groups on Facebook. Some of them are specific to Quebec educators. Some of them are about teaching during COVID-19. Uh, a lot of um, platforms like uh, the icon you see at the bottom right, that is Seesaw, they have uh, groups just are, that are specific to that platform for people as well. And uh, we think of these communities as part of our immediate staff as well. Some of those folks uh, are here today. Uh, so next we're going to do a poll. I'll leave that to Diane. I would um, like to mention that we may have to change the view for me to be starting the poll. I can't see it now that uh, we're sharing. So we may have to pop into another view or if someone else on the team can see polls and launch them, we could see them during practice. But of course, that's the way it goes online. We sometimes have to adapt. <laughs> Very quickly, though, I will say that the poll was, if no one's able to launch it for us, uh, the poll question was, what are the means that you are currently there? It is, thank you, my rescuer. What means, which means of communication are you currently using with your school team? And you can select as many as you would like, as many as apply. Um, we're just interested to know what kind of communication is happening right now. Okay, emails jumped into the lead, but live meetings is coming up a close second. I'll give you a couple more seconds to finish polling in here. Terrific. So hopefully you're seeing the results live on your screen, emails in the lead. Um, 
and live meetings though a lot of live meetings happening so some of you are probably getting very familiar with zoom just like we are so uh, thank you for sharing uh, your experience so far and we've got some others as well coming into the um, chat class dojo um, people mentioned zoom meetings or live meetings uh, so a few different experiences and we'll speak in a little bit as well about um, the importance of using tools um, with your team that you would also use with your students. Audrey? All right, so um, why are we even mentioning the team? Uh, why is it so important online? Isn't it always kind of important? Well, yes, it's just that teaching online can be awfully lonely. It can be lonely between classes when you feel like you're the only teacher in the, in the room, because you are. It can even be lonely during your class when you're wondering if anyone's even listening to you and nobody's responding to you. That can be lonely as well. So um, we need our team members now more than ever. We need them uh, for emotional support, for professional support, um, and we need them to face common challenges. Uh, sharing preps and activities will probably become absolutely necessary uh, at the beginning of next year, if not all year. Uh, we uh, overcome this somewhat by using this instant messaging uh, tool called Slack. And I just took a few screenshots just from uh, recently uh, showing uh, little conversations that su you know support us all during the day. Uh, for simple good mornings, the one on the left there, we this you know substitutes walking through the staff room and saying good morning to everybody, but also sharing ideas like Carrie shared uh, two different groups' reactions to the same uh, tool, Quizlet, and she and Stephanie were able to have a chat about that. And of course, uh, we need a place to react to things that happen outside of our control. We did have a conversation about this, but I will not show that to you at this time. Over to you, Diane. <laughs> so we've all heard the joke about meetings that could have been emails. Uh, but when we get together as a team, we really try to make sure the bulk of our regular meeting time is spent working together and learning from each other, not simply delivering information. I genuinely look forward to our meetings, I hope the rest of the team does too, as an opportunity to check in with everyone. Connecting with one another is such an important part of our meetings. We have to be a bit more deliberate about this when everyone is at a distance. In fact, I would say I've seen some benefits to online meetings over face-to-face, -face, and you may have too, including collaborating on documents to allow everyone to be heard and no co travel costs for PD. But uh, teams don't just happen. Uh, connections and security don't just happen. It takes time. And uh, fortunately, we have an administration that absolutely prioritizes this, though. And my wish for you all is that you will have the same. Um, we've used our time together to do things like solve problems. Like, for example, what do we do when uh, we have a kid uh, without internet? Or, or what do we do uh, when there's a power outage or a system crash? That's an actual live photo of, of me when that happened once. Not really. <laughs> um, I just want to highlight Amelia's comment. Um, I think it's a great one. And it's something that we do at LEARN as well, um, is that you've moved to weekly staff meetings during this time mm -hmm. for more connection. and. Uh, I 100% agree with that. Thank you for adding that comment, Amelia. Um, another thing that we do in our meetings is we work together to prepare presentations like this one or plan activities for important days in the year. Uh, we saw schools moving so quickly to develop presentations during the first weeks of school closures. And I just want to congratulate you all on the many amazing videos and messages for students that school teams created together. Ça va bien aller. Another idea I've seen schools try at a distance are school spirit days. So kudos to you all for so many positive initiatives. 
And as well as providing some fun and positive messaging for students, getting together online to plan these activities has had definitely the added benefit, hopefully for you too, of team building. Sharing the responsibility for building resources and learning objects is something that we would highly recommend. And we noticed on our, in module one of this session, that it came, to, came up as a tip from a number of teachers. Uh, team planning can be organized within your school or if you're in a very small school, even with other teachers in your school board. You all have lots of planning to do and wherever you can share the load, we strongly encourage that you do so. Another thing we do during our time together is we try out new tools. We've all been teaching online a long time. We've seen all the tools and one that we really fell in love with this year after the shutdown was Class Kick. So this is just a screenshot of us playing around with that particular tool. Uh, and you'll hear more about that later. And speaking of tools, uh, moving forward as a school team, we would highly recommend that you use common tools as much as possible. This was another tip shared um, on Monday during module one of our PD series. And we agree that common tools help to keep everyone in the staff speaking the same language, as well as remaining mindful of students and their parents and how they need to adapt to a variety of different platforms. Why common tools? Well, before classes start in the fall, all of the students who take online courses with us get a training session and support documents for the common tools that we use. This reduces the amount of time spent on tech support by teachers. Limiting the number of tools can streamline and help you and students stay organized. Be clear, for example, about the tool to use when students are submitting work so you're not looking all over for where their work is. Another tool we recommend that you might want to share would be a shared team calendar um, so that even at a distance you know if someone is teaching or in a meeting. Uh, but it's really important for all the team members to have that instant communication, especially if you're collaborating on something, because some things just can't wait until the next meeting. And email just can bog you down so much. Um, so uh, we need quick, we, ha we have quick access to each other, as I mentioned, through uh, Slack. Um, we can use that to reach either an individual person or you know, a whole team, a whole group of people. Uh, but there's a few other free resources that uh, are just like Slack. And uh, there's a link in the educator's toolbox to, um, to some other uh, names of, uh, there's like Microsoft Teams, I think that has something like that. Uh, Rocket Chat is another one. This actual webinar, we uh, spent a lot of time on Slack collaborating on as well as of course meeting in Zoom. And uh, yes, I did put some math in here. I am a math teacher. So um, as far as collegiality goes, uh, it starts from a, a place of truly believing this, this formula that, um, you know, uh, when we put the things that we know together in a pot, um, it, it turns into more than just the sum of those things because together we, we get better and better ideas. It's true in any team, of course, but it's an absolute lifesaver for online teachers. This culture of mistakes are welcome is one that we've become quite accustomed to. Uh, and that might be quite a big adjustment for everybody. Balancing between your comfort level and pushing the boundaries. I'll give you an example. We were extremely comfortable with uh, flipping our classroom. That's something you'll hear about later. It's a practice that we, we all uh, started a couple of years back for our synchronous classes. Uh, but then it became necessary for us to push that in order to accommodate some students who couldn't attend our live classes. We call those our self-paced students. And that took a good solid year, if not more, of trying and debating and brainstorming. And uh, ultimately, it led to many improvements for us and all of our students, but only because of this magic ingredient of being able to share easily and instantly and, and 
you know, listening to each other as well. Um, our students benefit from that culture too, both directly and indirectly. I just want to highlight a couple of great comments that I saw coming through in the chat when you were speaking that kind of hit on a few of your points, Audrey. Um, and uh, one was um, from Leslie Jill Davey. I'm blessed to have a teacher who joins my Zoom meeting with the students. And then we discuss the way it went after the students have left the meeting. Mm -hmm. Great practice. I love that. Um, so thank you for sharing. Uh, because let's face it. We're living in a new reality and adapting quickly to a huge challenge. This challenge will be easier to address by connecting with each other to make the important decisions for your school team. Clear and regular staff communications help everyone understand the big picture and your part in it and will help build staff readiness for whatever lies ahead. And we're hearing that change sometimes day to day. We recognize that you're all in the thick of it right now and uh, you're adjusting as quickly as you can. Um, and I've heard so many stories from teachers about the incredible ways in which you're meeting students' needs. So hopefully working together online with your school teams has made some of those challenges easier to face. We now have a, a question for you all. Um, and I'm going to ask if uh, our participants could type your answer to this question in the chat. I'll just uh, read it out. Uh, in the poll question earlier, you let us know how you've been communicating with your team during school closures. Now tell us what has worked best. So while you are answering in the chat, I will invite Carolyn Ko, who is one of our Learn Tutors from St. Mary's Elementary in Longueuil, to open your mic, Carolyn, and turn on your camera so that you can answer this question as well. Uh, thanks, Audrey. Um, so when the pandemic started, it was so difficult to keep track of emails, right? Uh, emails from teachers and admin and the school board and the union and parents. And so eventually it was very hard to find items and items were getting lost and uh, so our school team decided we were going to migrate to Microsoft Teams um, for all our staff, our daycare staff, our technicians, um, teachers especially, um, with different tabs, different channels on the side. Uh, this allowed for more fluid communication amongst, amongst different teams. So let's say if you were in, in cycle two and you dealt with cycle two uh, staff, well, you'd have, you'd have a channel to yourself, but everybody would uh, have access to all the channels um, in, the, in the Teams. It was very helpful, this, uh, these different channels, while we were adjusting the government kits um, to fit the needs of our students, uh, but at the same time ensuring that our whole school was on the same page and, and covering the material. Um, we are a large staff. We're over 65 uh, people in our staff. And so our staff meetings were held uh, via Zoom. Uh, it was very effective for large group communication, uh, just the ease of using it, uh, the sharing the screens and seeing people's faces. So that allowed us to be a little bit more connected, when, even virtually. Um, I think what also was very good about the Microsoft Teams and the Zoom is that uh, even our staff that's not super tech friendly, uh, you know, with small group trainings, uh, we've been able to reach everyone and get everybody online. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Some great comments, Carolyn, and I just want to highlight that a few people mentioned uh, a shout out to the tech team who made this happen in your schools. Uh, and that's 100% so important uh, when you're all learning new things to be well trained and have someone there to support you. We could not do it without our amazing IT team at Learn. Amen to that. Um, I'm going to jump in now. <clears throat> um, in this section, um, I'll be focusing on communicating with students and their supporters at home. Communicating with students and encouraging their voices um, is really important. I'll talk about strategies for the beginning of the year and how to maintain that on a regular basis throughout the year. As educators, we all know that communicating is a really important part of our job. So you might be thinking, why is it any different online? Well, without the visual cues, we don't get the same kind of immediate feedback from students. It's 
even more important that we be clear and concise with our instructions. Take your time to plan accordingly and to review all communications to make sure that your messages are getting across. Remember that not every student will prefer to communicate in the same way. Some really like to participate in big group discussions. They'll engage with the class as a whole. Some students, especially those who are shy, may just prefer to private message the teacher directly. Um, some will be okay with understanding oral instructions. Some need to see it written down. So you need to be flexible. You need to use uh, a variety of ways to communicate. Sharing plans with students um, in a consistent way also helps them to stay on track. And these are things, these tools are things that we can share with parents as well if they need to help support students at home, especially with younger learners. More on that later. Uh, Establishing a connection with students and setting the tone early on is really important. Not only at the beginning of the year, not only are they getting used to new teachers, new routines, new tools, but they're also learning subject matter too. And that's all, that's a lot of new. <laughs> um, it can make them kind of anxious and it's really important that we reassure students that they're not alone when, we're, when we're, they're at a distance. Um, I use a tool called VoiceThread, that's what you see here on the board, um, to introduce myself using video and audio at the beginning of the year, but you could use a simple letter instead. I have done that as well. Um, we often ask parents for an email response or, or even a Google form response to encourage some early contact with them. Um, we may ask questions like, what would you like me to know about your child's learning? Um, when you are setting things up at the beginning of the year, um, make your schedule predictable. Whether you're meeting once a week or every day, set a schedule and stick to it. It's especially important if students will be meeting with other teachers or, or if they'll be at school part of the time and at home part of the time. We, we still don't really know what that's going to look like for the fall. Um, how are you going to communicate with students? Are you going to use email? Are you going to use Twitter DMs? Um, if they can't open a document, how are they going to get in touch with you? If they get stuck on a concept or a practice question, how are they going to get help? Sometimes it's not enough to wait until your next live session. You want them to reach out when they have those questions. Um, but when are you <laughs> checking messages? When are you not? Um, Work-life balance is really important. I'm seeing a comment about that in the chat right now. Um, it's setting a schedule is really tough, um, but we do need to send, set boundaries so that we can manage, um, manage things for ourselves and not get burned out. You can see on the board here that, um, that I tell students that I can be um, reached by email or Twitter and that I'm the most responsive between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Thursday. Those are times when they know they'll get a pretty quick response. Outside of that time, they may need to wait. And I, as long as I'm clear with that up front, I think, I think it works okay. Uh, it's important to know what what's going to happen if there's a last minute change in plans as well in case of an emergency um, how are you going to contact students if your internet goes down and you can't make it to a live session um, yeah that you can have virtual office hours either have them scheduled or that could be something that you um, that you set up on the fly for a student who's struggling it depends on what you're comfortable with and it depends on what you establish with them in terms of the norm um, regularly communicating with students about upcoming plans is really important, especially online. Um, our self-paced model, uh, it was referred to earlier, is for students who primarily work asynchronously. So usually we have up only about 30 minutes live with them um, and the rest of the uh, every week and the rest of the time they are working um, independently. For those students that provide monthly plans, it gives them a suggested pacing for the activities to give them something to help encourage them along, but it also includes important dates, uh, such as deadlines for assignments, um, hands-on activities, if there are materials that they need, they need to know that ahead of time, and uh, of course, if there are upcoming evaluations. 
More detailed weekly plans can also be useful. Here's an example of one of mine. It has due dates across the top. Um, it tells them what we're going to be doing in class that day at a very high level. And it also lets them know what they are responsible for between classes. Uh, at the beginning of every live session, I put up an agenda slide like this one. You can think of it like having an agenda for a meeting. Um, it provides students with details on what you're going to do when we're together. And it also has important reminders. Uh, the bonus for me, because I tend to forget things, is that it helps me to stay organized. So I know, okay, when I'm finished with that first task, what did I have planned next? Oh yeah, I can go back and look at my plan for the day and it helps to keep, keep me on track as well. I want to just emphasize one thing that um, that I, I didn't build this all at once. Um, when I started teaching online, I started with weekly plans only and then eventually realized I needed a daily agenda. And then recently, only last year, I think I added in the monthly plan. So it's not something that has to happen uh, in time for September. This is something you could slowly build over time. After every live class, I post an announcement in Sakai, which is our learning management system. And that is intended to remind students of their homework, um, provide information for students who are absent so that they know what has been done. And that gives them some autonomy to catch up on their own. Um, and there are also links to recordings um, of our in-class sessions. We do record most of our in-class sessions um, with Learn so that students who are not able to be there can watch it later on. Um, I used to do something similar with Google Classroom in the past, the an announcement that was just in the feed. Here's a scenario. <laughs> Let's say, for the sake of argument, that your class is going to be 50-50 next year. Let's say that half your students will be in class with you on any given day and half of them will be at home. How are you going to communicate with those students at home or check in with them in a really efficient way so that you know what they've covered and what questions they have for when they come back to class and you're with them face to face again. So this is a strategy that we have been using for our self paced uh, students that could be adapted for the 50 50 scenario. You can see here this this is a checklist for my chemistry students. Um, it's telling them what tasks they need to do for this particular lesson. The thing that I like about Google Forms is that it consolidates all of that, um, all of those responses in one place. So I can look at one summary, one spreadsheet document, and I, and I see everything all together. So I, I want to touch a little bit on a couple of tools that I think are especially good for communication. Um, this is one that that we use quite a bit in our live sessions. It's called Desmos Activity Builder. Um, I use it quite often to create virtual worksheets. It, it allows me to see everyone's work and collects it in one place, which is a bonus. Um, we'll talk more about this in next week's webinar. Um, but Desmos has some pre-built screens like this one that make it really easy to do quick check-ins with students. This one has a slider that, that but there are others that allow students to draw, like the one on the next slide. Uh, this is a response from a student. Um, uh, this was a bright moment in his week uh, where it was warm outside and he sat on the deck with his dogs. Um, so using tools like this help you to keep the lines of communication open and gives students options in terms of how they communicate with you. Providing feedback on a regular basis is also important. Um, we use the Google Suite quite a bit for collaborative activities um, and for sharing students work with one another. These tools can be used to communicate feedback to an individual student in an efficient way. Um, and this is an activity that I set up for my chemistry students. Um, I have a, a slide deck that has a unique question for every student. It's all on the same topic, but they're all slightly different. Um, you can see Nicholas is here on the screen, but each student has their own slide. They're all working on their individual slides, um, and I'm providing them with feedback using the comment tool. So this is, this is one activity where 
everything is visible to everyone, the slide and the comments. And so they can all learn from each other's successes and mistakes. They're modeling for each other right in that document. The last tool I'm going to introduce you to is ClassKick, which um, Audrey mentioned earlier. Um, love this tool. <laughs> I can't emphasize it enough. Um, it, can, it also gets a lot of students working online at the same time. And like Desmos, you can see everyone's work at the same place and see their work live as they're working on it, as they're editing even. Um, but this tool allows you to add private feedback right into the tool as well. So on the left is a pretty simple, quick little worksheet kind of activity. Um, and you can see that Alec has answered in black and I've given him feedback in green right as he's working. You can add videos, resources, um, uh, it, videos and resources as well. On the right is an example of a manipulative acti activity um, that's intended for grade two. In this activity, students are introduced to rulers and they're using them to compare lengths of objects. They can actually drag those little, uh, those little images around in order to rank them. Very engaging, <laughs> that tool. Um, all right, so uh, I have a question now that I'm going to ask Courtney Jarvo from St. Mary's Elementary Riverside School Board to answer using her webcam and mic, but everyone else, please respond to this question in the chat. How are you providing communication, support, and feedback to your students and their families? Thanks. So I teach an elementary school class of students with behavior difficulties, so they're not always the easiest students to work with. I've always used Class Dojo to communicate with the parents of my students, and I'm able to post our weekly schedule with clickable links so that the parents uh, know what their children should be working on at what times. I post the same schedule on Google Classroom for my students to check off their work as they complete it. I found that providing a weekly schedule helps students manage their time. As my students are working, they can communicate with me in several different ways. Since many of the parents are working full-time jobs and keeping their kids at home, I wanted the students to have a way to reach me directly. If they have a specific question about their work, they can comment on that Google Classroom assignment. I can meet them on the file and work through it with them. They can also send me messages on Google Hangouts or we can start a video chat. Once they complete an assignment, I can provide feedback and a grade to them through Google Classroom. All of my students have been present online at our daily Zoom meetings and I completed all of their online assignments. The ease of use of this technology and the easy access to their teachers have allowed for this to happen with these students. Okay. Thanks, Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. Oh, sorry, Diane. <laughs> I just wanted, I just, there was some really great ideas in the uh, chat and I just wanted to pull one out if that's okay. Um, from a secondary teacher who uses Instagram to communicate with his students. Certainly um, an app, uh, you know, a, some social media where students are as, at, as teens. So he's connecting with them where they are. So that's from Jeremy Wout, a great okay. idea. Thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Courtney. That was great. Um, so we are going to shift gears into our final uh, session, part of our session today, which is humanizing the online interaction. Um, so we'll look at three elements. Uh, we'll look at, uh, if we go to the next slide, we're going to focus on um, how do you humanize yourself in an online environment? How do you um, humanize that teacher-student relationship when they're in somewhere and you are in another location? And also, how do you humanize and build the connection between individual students when they too are geographically separated? So this is what we're gonna focus on in this, uh, this part of our session. So how do we do it? How do we set the stage? We've all done it in our face-to-face -face classrooms, but what do we do when it's um, at a distance? Uh, this year, we at least knew our students before we got separated from them. So what do we do to set the stage uh, should we not be face-to-face -face, uh, in the fall? Um, things are changing, we really don't know. So um, when we think about humanizing ourselves, it's really important in an online environment to uh, let the student know who we are 
So what do we like? What do we care about? What matters to us? Where are our interests? And that becomes more and more important um, because we want to early on establish that connection, that relationship, and we want them to trust us early or they won't come back. Um, also, we want to model for them how to communicate and Carrie got into that a little bit, but just making it clear how to uh, communicate appropriately in an online environment is also something that we set the stage for early on uh, to humanize that experience. Um, Carrie mentioned VoiceThread early, and VoiceThread is like one of our favorites, so we use it a lot, but uh, like Carrie, I also use an introductory um, VT that I send out before the first day of class, so they have a chance to get to know me a little bit, uh, five minutes. Uh, I usually try to cap it at, and I include my voice, and I let them see pictures of me and my family and my interests, uh, maybe key highlights of my life. Um, and my interests, my favorites. And then at the end, what I'll do is I'll ask them on the last slide to go ahead and either post a private, uh, in the VT, post their own um, favorite. So a picture with some video or audio to let me know what they care about. Um, and um, the other option that I give them is also a tool called, an app called Photobabble. I don't know if people know it, but very simple tool. You can, uh, you can do it from an iPhone, um, add some audio to, uh, a photo and then share that link. Um, and so I have them do that as well. And I love that one. And really it's about, it's, it's about creating that connection. They need the visual, they need the auditory. Um, so those two things are, are two of the things that I do. Uh, and Peggy, you have your own thing that you do as well. And maybe you could share that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, yeah, so during Monday's presentation, I know that some teachers expressed that they had concerns about how to connect uh, online with their new students. I know that everyone here is extremely innovative, and I know that you will create that personal touch that reflects your reality. But this is my reality. This is how I start the year, because I know that my students wonder, well, who is this know-it-all teacher from Quebec City who is trying to teach me math? Am I smart enough to be in this class? Or maybe uh, they are just overwhelmed. They think that they're going to be overwhelmed with the technology. So I like to create uh, a letter that I send to the students at the beginning of the year. This creates an environment where students feel that they can thrive. I want them to feel they're in the right place. I want them to know they matter. I know a lot of teachers send letters, but as I said, this is our reality. So before class begins in August, I send an old fashioned paper letter to all my students. I sign it and I send it snail mail, not an email. I introduce myself and I write that I look forward to collaborating and to learning with them. I, I look forward to working with an awesome group of students. This coming August, though, I know that my letter will be tweaked in order to reflect that I understand the difficult situation they experienced because of the shutdown. My goal is to set the stage to reassure them that they will be in the right place and I will be with them throughout the year. In order to maintain these connections throughout the year, we find ways to show our true self. This motivates a learner to know that we care and we're there for them. Here are a few examples. Meanwhile, I would like to explain how voice threads maintain that human aspect. So as you see, all the teachers use voice thread and the students call them VTs, by the way. I noticed that someone asked, what's a VT? A VT, the students have baptized them as uh, uh, the, their word for voice threads. Uh, we flip the class. So we use this web-based tool and that is to deliver the subject matter. It allows us to uh, give a teacher presence. The subject content is delivered by each individual teacher and not provided by another teacher such as Khan Academy. We use our webcam on the opening slide and as often as we can to in, uh, in order to show our teacher presence. And we can respond to students' questions right in that voice thread. 
VTs allows us to remind the students we're sitting next to them at all times. And I think you can begin by referring I'm muting to myself. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it helps to unmute yourself. Um, so uh, thank you for that. But uh, we use VTs a lot because, and it actually lends itself to this, um, to our next section here, which is really humanizing that teacher-student relationship. And it's, you know, it's something that is, is challenging to do when you're at a distance. And especially when, I mean, we're all online teachers, so we've, we've done it for a long time and it can feel really challenging, um, you know, but we want to think about why it is that we're doing it. Um, what it is, what is it that we want to do? Um, we want them to know where they can find us and, and carry got into this communication piece, but we want them to know how to communicate with us, where they can communicate with us. Um, but we also want to use those tools that we'll use for communication to create those connections. So before we start getting into the learning with them, we want them to familiarize themselves with the tool, but in a way that is uh, meaningful and creates relationship. Uh, so we'll take a look at uh, on the next slide of a few examples of some of the things that I do. So I saw a lot of people mention that they use Teams. Um, so one of the things that I do um, with my students is within the first two days is I have a channel set up for one-on-one -on -one office hours. So using a Google Doc, I will have them sign up for a five minute slot. It's almost like speed dating with your students. Um, but we, we get together one-on-one, -on -one. they can share any concerns, any, uh, anything they wanna ask me, any, any questions or thoughts or feelings they have, any of their interests. So we have that five minutes and it is, it does take time, but it's super important. Um, and it, it's just time that you, you can't get back later. So it's, it's a good investment early on to take that time to meet with each student one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and it's something that in a face-to-face -face class we may not do, but it is something that we can do in an online environment, which is great. Um, the middle one, I'm sure elementary teachers probably know this one, but I, I've used it with my SAGEP students as well. It's, um, it's the me collage. It's where you give them 20, uh, you, you give them a, a cap, 20 or 30 things that demonstrate uh, their interest that, you know, it's like a visual representation of them on paper. And I make them do it on paper. Um, some of them say, I don't have paper. Well, you know, use pencils, use whatever you've got, but there's just something tactile about creating something um, and having a tangible thing. They can then take a picture of it and, uh, and share it with me. If they really don't have pen and paper at home, which may be the case, crayons, whatever, they can always do a digital collage. It's very easy to find. Uh, there's tons of apps out there or even just cutting and pasting pictures um, into a, um, a Google Doc will work. Um, so that's something that I use a lot and I really love it and the students love it. And it's the, it's the tangibility of it that I feel is so important in an online space that they can put it up and be proud of it and be proud of themselves as they work online at a distance. Um, and then the third one here is a, is a YouTube playlist. So what I do on the, my very first day of class um, is, and I know it, it's sort of dependent on your age group. Um, I teach uh, primarily high school and SAGEP, like I said. Um, so what I'll do on the first day as they're all trickling into class is I'll ask them to post in the chat their summer song. So it's, again, it's a chance for them to try to use the tool. It's something fun, it's engaging. Everybody has a song, hopefully, um, that they like. And uh, once they've shared those with me at the end of the first class, I go in and I create a, a private playlist that I then share the link to. And it, it, just, uh, it just shows them that you care and it's something fun and they listen to it over and over again. And, and then later on as an English teacher, I'll use some of the lyrics to, to teach literary devices. Um, but those are just some examples that I do. And again, it's really, it's about, you know, showing yourself to them um, and letting them show themselves to you. So those are my examples. Um, and uh, Great examples, Stephanie. Thank you. Yeah. Um, student, students need that social presence from the moment they enter the class until they exit. Uh, when I taught in a face-to-face -face school, I stood at the door and I greeted each student as they walked in. Well, the same happens in an online class. Uh, I greet each student by name at the beginning of class and I find a meaning, meaningful way to say goodbye to each student individually. We have several strategies to maintain that student-teacher connection, but I would like to highlight direct messaging and personalized work schedules. 
that the students really like. Um, direct messaging is powerful and a lot of you use Zoom and I know you probably see how powerful it is, but VTs and Twitter have that capability as well. And to maintain that teacher-student relationship, responding to a student's concerns is time well spent. VTs and Twitter are, to, uh, are tools that I use asynchronously. In a VT, when I prompt the student to answer a question, they can message me privately if they wish to do so, or they can share with the class what their answers are. And I have that capability as well to answer privately to them or to answer to the group. Twitter, I use Twitter tremendously. I like to think Twitter is the open door to my classroom. It's a place where students can feel safe to express their concerns. It's a place where they can ask me for feedback on a problem that they are having issues with. What I've noticed is if I interact with them on a regular basis, they will interact with me. Another example of maintaining that teacher student connection is by providing what I call a personalized work schedule. I create a Google Doc for each student and I remind them I'm here. Students select the questions that they would like to work on. There's a minimum requirement of questions to do though. And students love that element of choice and they feel that they can customize their work. I do require that they make their thinking visible and providing feedback in a timely fashion helps them feel that I'm always sitting next to them. I know teachers have expressed that they have concerns about corrections being time consuming, but copy and paste is a huge uh, savior for me. If the answer is incorrect, I have prepared uh, short uh, video recordings that uh, explains the steps to solving that problem. Students have expressed to me that these videos help them tremendously. Thank you, Peggy. Um, so we're into our final component here, which is being, be creating the humanizing element between students uh, while, while at a distance. Um, how do we do that when, um, when they're so far away? Um, they have their own means outside of the classroom, but those may not be the ones that we want to foster in them using. Uh, the reason that we spend this time early on setting the stage with the students to, to connect with each other is one is to build the self-efficacy that they see their value within the group, that they're willing to take the risks and engage with the other students in a community of learners. But it also is that chance to create that social co cohesion. We want them to feel engaged early and we want them to keep coming back. If they don't feel connected, um, it's harder to do in a face-to-face -face class. You have to be there. Well, some of us, if we work with at-risk youth, we know that if they don't feel connected, they don't come. Um, it, a lot of students in, in the online, we have to really in, in, encourage them to engage with us and to stay engaged throughout the year. Uh, Peggy, you had a really good idea for how you set the stage in a tool that you use, correct? Uh, yeah, Flipgrid. And I know a lot of teachers use Flipgrid. Uh, as we said at the beginning, our uh, students come from the four corners of the province. It's crucial to uh, attend to the, their critical um, need for that engagement. Uh, and uh, it's important to foster that community uh, building. Flipgrid is a great tool that empowers every learner to share their voice and to respect the diverse uh, voices of other students as well. So I've had many, many, many teachers um, speak to me in the last couple months about this concern. And it's a real concern, again, like I said, about maintaining that engagement with the students um, in the learning process and not, you know, for me, I saw a lot of people working in teams, uh, not just seeing the initials uh, on the screen and them completely being devoid of engagement. And we don't want that. Um, you know, learn well in all in all our practices, and I'm sure you all are doing this as well. You know, you're looking for ways 
to um, engage the students, to get them in project-based activities, uh, to do collaboration on maybe Google Docs or slides. Um, you want them to have the opportunity to discuss things, to collaborate on things, to create things. Um, and doing that rather than focusing on individual assignments can really help um, to foster uh, to foster that connectivity that it will sustain over time. Um, and on the sh on the slide here, you can see just some of the asynchronous and synchronous tools that we use um, to build that online connectedness. Um, Peggy, you had something as well, no? Yeah, I just want to talk just a little bit about the themes that we have for each term. Uh, term one is. Um, uh, providing opportunities for the students to learn about the online tools. Term two is the big one that I want to talk about right now, and that is building community with my online classmates. And we have a lot of activities uh, that foster that um, uh, uh, that discussion among students. Uh, and that enhances the sense of their community. These discussions don't always have to be about the subject matter. As a matter of fact, a lot of the discussions are surrounded about things like, what does success mean to me? Or what helps me manage my stress? Something that the students are um, quite concerned about. We have several tools such as forums that allow these discussions, but sometimes expressing their feelings to me only allows them to speak their mind. I saw a lot of teachers uh, use Seesaw. We use Seesaw as well. Uh, and our students reflect in Seesaw, but that conversation is between me and uh, the student only. And what I realized is that when I read these reflections, there are many things that the other students could benefit from. So I realized that I should share these comments and I share them anonymously. I, and I realize the following when I do share these conversations because rich conversations uh, happen when I share them. I realize that the authors of these student quotes feel valued in their online world. And most of all, all students feel, hey, I'm not the only one that feels that way. And suddenly they don't feel so alone. We have regular dance parties and this has proven to maintain a community of learning. I know you all feel the same way we do. We all need to have a bit of fun. We all need to be silly sometimes, especially when they're silly looking at me dancing. Uh, we all need celebrations and we definitely all need to move and to get out of our chair. That's totally true. Um, I'm at a standing desk right now, so I'm, I'm mad in my chair. I'm ready to go if you want to pull a song there. Maybe. Um, we've actually come pretty close to full circle. Um, uh, all of us really at LEARN, I mean, we love learning. We're teachers. We've all been teachers for 20 plus years. We're passionate about what we do. And we just want all of you to know that this is not, you're not alone. We're in this together. This is a team effort. It takes a village. Um, you know, we are just one piece of this very large puzzle as we move forward. Um, and keep that in mind with your teams uh, that you have within your schools or your, uh, your learning communities that you have already established. Use those people um, and incorporate those people. Um, this, this slide is just an example of one of the things that we've done in the last two months at LEARN, which was we had a slow chat which involved uh, a slow Twitter, Twitter chat that happened over several days. We, we posted a new question each day, a, a teacher, or, or in this case, Christine, our lovely Christine. Um, all of us created a question and it was posted and the students and the admin and learn staff and really the entire world um, were able to, to share and connect. And it just built this really amazing place for the students and for us uh, to go beyond uh, our virtual walls at LEARN. So, and, and the things that the students posted were really, um, uh, some pictures were breathtaking and inspiring and it, it's, it's just really moving. So please don't forget, I know it can feel like you're alone, but, but we're not. Um, just reach out to people um, and, and we'll help each other, you know? Um, so as we 
come to the end of our, our hour here, uh, we're getting very close. We wanted to pose a question to the chat uh, to all of you, which is, what is one thing that you will try to implement next year to humanize the online learning experience should you continue to be virtual? So please share with us any ideas you have and we, we wanna hear them. Flipgrid, yeah. It's true. It's one thing when we say the, the hellos, but the goodbyes are important too. Well, I'm glad you like the playlist. It's pretty fun. Thanks for sharing, guys. I saw some new things. I need the transcript of this chat. Yeah, and Lauren, I want to be invited to your uh, dance party. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> you know how to reach me, Lauren. I want to be there. Absolutely. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great. And I know a lot of you have at mentioned there were, there's a lot covered. We really touched on a lot of things. Um, but please, if you didn't get that link, it will be sent to you. Check out educatorstoolbox.learnquebec.ca. Uh, over the coming days, the recordings for all those sessions will be um, populated in that site. Um, complimentary resources. You've asked for some things in the chat. We've seen them. We're keeping an archive of this chat so we can go back and make sure we're answering your questions and addressing the, your needs that you've identified. So thank you for spending the time doing that. We really appreciate your communication and your connection in the chat. Uh, it's really, it really uh, brought some richness. Yes, we do hear, hear those elementary teachers. Absolutely. Um, we'll try to respond as quickly as possible as we can. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It was a real pleasure. We'll see you next time. Uh, if you registered, if you were a lucky person who got to register, our next session will be on Monday, as I look at my calendar, Monday, June 22nd. And uh, some of you will see you then. The rest of you will look forward to uh, you engaging with the Educators Toolbox website. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.